Hello everybody, welcome to Blue Marble Science. On August the 14th, we were running the very last test on Cavendish, and about 30 minutes into that test, a magnitude 7.2 earthquake occurred near Lakaya in Haiti. Cavendish actually responded to that seismic event. This is pretty interesting stuff, so let's have a look at what we saw. This is part of the live stream video that I've sped up by a factor of about 15 and it starts about one minute after the earthquake occurred in Haiti. That happened at 829. What you see right now is just the normal slow steady movement of the torsion balance as it rotates and oscillates around two extreme points. But watch at about 838 on that clock and you'll notice that the laser begins to bounce up and down vertically. Now that is not a motion that we normally see unless we bump the balance. If we bump that cabinet, we see that. This time, nothing like that happened. Let's slow it down and see what it looks like in real time. Now for those of you interested in doing a little science, pause the video open up a stopwatch and time this vertical bounce. Count about 10 of these bounces and I think you'll find that the period is about 1.7 seconds. Now that'll become important in a little while because this tells us what the balance is doing. The torsion balance is actually acting like not only a torsion balance but like a normal gravity pendulum. These vertical movements of the laser continue, but they subside over a period of time. And now an hour or so later, you'll see that they have virtually disappeared. And by the time we get to the second half of the test, they're completely gone. Let's see if we can definitively tie what we saw to that earthquake in Haiti. Since I didn't do anything to disturb the balance, can we tie this to some sort of seismic activity? And the first thing that came to mind is, could it have been some local seismic event? Well, here's earthquake data for the area in which I live for the period of August the 13th through the 15th. There was one magnitude 2 earthquake that occurred on the 15th, so that one doesn't count. That's the day after. Obviously, nothing happened locally that we would have seen. Let's look on a more global basis. Now we can ignore anything an hour or an hour and a half prior to the event that we witnessed. So we want to look at the time period from 1100 to 1300 UTC. When we look in the time frame from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock UTC, we find that there is one magnitude 6 earthquake that occurred and then some magnitude 4 earthquakes. When we look in the time period from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, we see the magnitude 7 in Haiti and some magnitude 5 and magnitude 4 activity. So let's check out the timing. Here are the 10 largest earthquakes in the world for August the 14th. Number one, of course, is the 7.2 that we see in Haiti and it occurred at 8.29 a.m. That's 12.29 UTC. Then a 6.9 quake in the Gulf of Alaska, which occurred at 3.57 a.m., but that is 11.57 a.m., about 40 minutes before we saw that activity. So the timing and strength of that earthquake may not be a very good match. Let's take a look at that on the map. So there we see the 6.9 earthquake that happened in Alaska at 11.57 UTC. And we see the magnitude 7.2 that occurred in Haiti at 12.29 UTC. Now keep something in mind, that doesn't seem like a lot of difference. But the energy released by that 7.2 earthquake is roughly three times as much energy as the 6.9 earthquake in Alaska. Let's have a look at this on Google Earth. So we see the magnitude 6.9 in Alaska and it is 5,800 kilometers away from my location. 
We see the magnitude 7.2 on the other hand in Haiti and it is 2200 kilometers away. It appears that the most likely thing we would have seen would have been that earthquake in Haiti. Now because I'm not a flat earther I don't think I can read a wiki article and become an instant seismic expert. I chose a more pragmatic route and I went to the US Geological Survey and I asked them about it. This was the response I got. Indeed, what you saw were likely the surface waves from the Haiti earthquake. The P waves and S waves were probably too high frequency to have been observed, but the surface waves are lower frequency. The oscillations of the whole earth could also have been recorded and they are very low frequency very cool well you know what i think so too very cool but that still leaves us with a question and the question is why does the balance do what it does well let's have a look you may have seen this before this is the torsion balance we have this t-shaped wooden beam and two small weights hanging on either end of the beam now when we move the large weights in close proximity to those small ones. The masses attract each other and because the torsion balance is hanging from the torsion wire, that causes the entire beam to rotate and that applies a torque to the torsion wire. Now what happens is the beam actually rotates and overshoots its resting position It'll reverse its direction and then rotate the opposite direction, again overshooting. But each time the overshoot will become less and less. And eventually, the beam will stop oscillating. This is exactly like a gravity pendulum. It's like a plumb bob. Everybody's seen this before. If you leave it alone long enough, it will finally stop moving. And the torsion beam will do the same thing. But now, if we take a laser, like this one, and we shine that laser on a mirror that is mounted on the torsion beam itself, when the beam rotates, that changes the angle of incidence of the laser to the mirror, and it causes the laser spot to move horizontally. Let's take a look at the time-lapse video that was shot on August the 14th. And as we watch this, we can clearly see the upset condition occur where the laser spot begins bouncing up and down. But you'll notice that over a period of time, that up and down motion ceases. And by the time we move the large weights into the opposite position, the laser is back stable again. It's simply moving left and right. Well, what's causing that? Let's take a look at this beam. Let's look at a cross section through the beam and it would look something like this. We would see the wooden beam at the bottom. We would see the mirror mounted on the beam. And then we would see the torsion wire that it's hanging from. Now notice that this looks a lot like a pendulum. So if we vibrate the wooden case and we cause the beam to start oscillating forward and backward, what's going to happen? Well, as the beam swings forward, again, just like the horizontal motion, we change the angle of incidence with the laser and the laser spot will move up a little bit. And when it swings back, the laser spot will move down a little bit. Now, this is the motion that we're seeing. It's the motion of a simple pendulum. Can we prove that? Yeah, I think we can. Remember our 1.7 second measurement? Well, we can calculate the period of oscillation of a gravity pendulum simply by the formula 2 pi times the square root of L over G, where L is the length of the pendulum and G is the acceleration of gravity. Now for Cavendish, that torsion wire is the length of the pendulum and it's about 0.7 meters. So if we do the math, we end up with, guess what? 
1.7 seconds. So this is exactly what we're seeing. We're simply seeing the wooden beam swinging front to back in the enclosure. Does that have any effect on the rotation? Uh, maybe a little. Let's see how much effect it had. This is a plot of the oscillation from that time lapse video. Now normally when I move the weights into position, I ignore the first peak or the first extreme. So the first measurement that I took was this one at 829. And that's about the time the earthquake occurred. The next peak is at 837, and that's still before the time we saw the torsion balance start reacting. The next peak was at 845, and by then, the balance was absolutely reacting, but it doesn't seem to be having any effect on our measurements. So we take one more measurement at 853, and everything still looks fine on the graph. Now from that point on, you notice that the oscillation no longer seems to be behaving like a damped oscillation should. The next peak is actually higher. So the appropriate thing to do is just ignore this data from that point forward. It really doesn't matter because we only really need three points. We could just simply take the first three. We don't even need the fourth one. And we get that data set that you see there. And then we do the same thing after we move the weights into the other position. We use those four points and we get that data set. Now we have two rest positions that we can use to calculate the value of big G. Let's see how that worked out. This is all the series three tests. This is test number 31 through 46, a total of 16 tests. The very last one is the one of August the 14th, and the calculated value of G, based on that data we just looked at, is 6.74 times 10 to the minus 11th Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. And that's a little on the high side, but it's not the highest. We've got a 7.02, we've got a 6.82. On June the 6th, we've got one at 6.71, which is very nearly the same as the value we measured on August the 14th. So I can't see any reason to say there was anything wrong with this test. Even though we had an upset condition in the middle of it, the value for G that we get using the data is very much in line with all the other testing we've done. But I think the amazing part is this Cavendish device was able to detect the motion of the Earth that it's sitting on. And to quote the USGS one more time, that's really cool. Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget the like and subscribe buttons down there. Shout out to the patrons and PayPals. Thanks for everything you guys do, and we'll see you on the next one.